welcome to this 2021 British Library food season event, exhibiting excess food through art and history, very generously supported by KitchenAid. My name is Polly Russell and I'm the founder and curator of the food season, working closely with the food writer Angela Clutton, who is the season's guest director. This is the fourth of food's food season for the British Library and like seasons before we have an eclectic series of events which explore food in every aspect. So tonight we're doing 5,000 years of food history through two landmark exhibitions. Next week we've got the history of British food, we've got the life of Churchill's cook, we've got British Library manuscript food collections and that's just next week. So please check out the British Library website and the food season page which is also linked at the end of this event on your screens to find out more. On this page you'll also find details about the food season competition we're running giving you the chance to win a range of KitchenAid coldless appliances, a place on a virtual cooking course and a signed copy of The Pie Room by Callum Franklin. So just a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. Please use the menu on your screen to give us feedback on the event and also to donate to the British Library. We really value your feedback and of course we really value your donations. Uh, also click on the bookshop tab for an opportunity to buy books from our speakers. Right, now today's event, which I'm delighted to be chairing. We're exploring two extraordinary food exhibitions. The brilliant Feast and Fast, The Art of Food in Europe, 1500 to 1800, which was staged by the Fitzwilliam Museum in Cambridge last year, uh, but is no, now no longer open, had to close early because of COVID. And Tables of Power, A History of Prestigious Meals, which is currently on at the Louvre Lons in France. And I'm delighted to say that we have members of the curatorial teams who staged these exhibitions with us tonight. From France, we have Hélène Bouillon, a doctor of Egyptology specializing in relations between Egypt and the Near East in antiquity. She is the heritage curator for the Louvre Lons Museum's exhibitions and was one of the team who curated Tables of Power. Victoria Avery is the keeper of the Applied Arts Director Direct Department at the Fitzwilliam Museum. Victoria has researched, lectured, and published widely on all aspects of the applied arts, and she co-curated Feast and Fast. And Ivan Day is an independent food historian who has more than 40 years of experience recreating period food using original historic equipment and methods. He is particularly interested in the evolution of table display and his work has been featured in so many exhibitions, I cannot name them all, but he worked with the Cambridge curatorial team on Feast and Fast. So this is our amazing panel. Now, hello everybody. Um, to say that this year has been a challenging time for museums is a real understatement. You know, COVID has forced exhibitions to close and cancel. So for many of us watching, this will be the first opportunity, the only opportunity to have a glimpse of these extraordinary exhibitions. Uh, I actually did manage to get to Feast and Fast before it was forced to close and it was extraordinary. And I cannot wait to find out more about it and also to find out about tables of power. But it just feels like in the context of COVID, this is an extremely special event to have this opportunity. So just to explain to our audience very quickly how the evening is going to run. Um, we are, uh, each of the speakers, so Victoria and uh, Ivan, are going to talk for about 20 minutes about Feast, um, about the, the exhibition at the Fitzwilliam uh, exhibition, uh, Museum, uh, Feast and Fast. And so that we can all find out about it. And then LM will talk for about 10, 10 or so minutes about tables of power. We'll then have an opportunity to have a discussion amongst ourselves um, for about 10 or 15 minutes. And then we would love to have uh, audience questions. So please do uh, ask questions. There's a tab at the bottom of your screen. We'd love to hear from you. So without further ado, um, I'm going to hand over to Victoria and say welcome and please tell us about the wonderful exhibition that you co-curated at the Fitzwilliam Museum. Thank you very much indeed, Polly. We'll have the um, deck of slides up if we can start, please. Um, what I should absolutely say at the start is that um, uh, we were absolutely, Ivan and I were absolutely ably assisted by uh, Dr. Melissa Calarezu, um, who was the co-curator um, of the exhibition. She's a, um, 
a, a cultural historian based at Gonville and Keys College in Cambridge. And it was a typical Fitzwilliam Museum where we um, combine academic expertise with um, curation and objects. Um, uh, as, as we've said, unfortunately, the exhibition um, had to shut early in, in March, but actually was given a, an, a reprieve for a month uh, in, uh, in, in August, which was lovely to allow a few more visitors to see. What we're going to do now is I'm going to speak very briefly about um, some of the key themes uh, in the exhibition. Um, and then I'm going to hand over to Ivan to talk about some of the uh, highlight objects. And then I'll end up by talking about some of the um, community engagement and visitor responses. Um, so in terms of uh, uh, next slide, yeah, some of the key themes in the exhibition, um, it was called deliberately feast and fast. In a way, they are two sides of very much the same coin. And we wanted to think about everyday eating, but also um, excess uh, and also in a sense deprivation in the early modern period. And thinking about um, fasting times, uh, we, we made our audience aware that actually during the early modern period, if you observed uh, all the fast days as prescribed by the church and also by the secular government, you might be fasting, not eating meat or dairy derived products for something like a third or a quarter of the year. So actually there was a lot of uh, food deprivation or special food choices going on. Um, also about production, provisioning and preservation of food, thinking about um, access and thinking about seasonality. Um, uh, making people understand that actually, uh, you know, even if you were the wealthy Aristos uh, and you had access to greater amounts of land and, and, and to food, that actually seasonality um, played a role that it doesn't really play so much today when actually you can buy anything you want in a supermarket. Preparation and uh, presentation, these are key to us today, but they were very key to uh, audiences in the past. So thinking about what was traditional and what was innovative were also themes we were trying to pull out. Um, cookbooks, recipes, how they're passed on, um, the, the skills of the kitchen, um, knowledge transfer was something we were very interested in because obviously audiences are interested in celebrity cooks today. And we wanted to make the point that actually that's nothing new. Um, but also food choices. Obviously, economics plays a part, seasonality plays a part, but also religious, medical and politics played a part. So these were some of the key themes that we were keen to um, address. Um, I'm just going to show you now just a couple of slides by way of example of one of these themes. So we're thinking about local and global. And in terms of global, in the early modern period, of course, trade routes open up. All the European powers are vying with each other, finding new trade routes and bringing in so-called exotic foodstuffs. So we had a section where we focused on four different food items, the pomegranate. And in this slide, you can see um, uh, on the uh, on the left, there was a wall with pomegranate, and we've got uh, pomegranate, and then uh, another section about pineapples. And then we thought about ginger and we thought about sugar. And in the middle of the room, you can see here um, a detail of um, one of Ivan's wonderful recreations, a top end Georgian um, confectioner's uh, window. Uh, and you can see here a detail of that window. It was inspired by this wonderful Gilray print. Um, uh, um, soldiers scoffing um, wonderful whipped syllabubs and ice cream in, um, in a London confectioner shop, Gilray's. And you can see in the background the shop window with exotic fruits. Um, and this is what we were trying to, um, to explain to, uh, to, to our audiences. Um, the porcelain, the glassware that was sold or hired out, but also the sweet treats, the cakes, as well as the um, exotic imported oranges and pineapples and other fruit uh, like that. The backside of that same display showed the workshop with all the tools and the um, instruction manuals and the equipment to make all of the sweet treats, the biscuits, the cakes and so on. And on the left side, you can see that the, the room continues and you'll see that case, inbuilt wall case, with items paraphernalia connected with sugar and uh, the production of ginger. I'm just gonna point out the bottom of the case, bottom left, there are some little gingerbread molds that Ivan will be talking to um, uh, in a minute. Um, so in that case, you can see now a little detail of some of these wonderful sugar crafts and some of Ivan's moulds and his uh, tools. 
but we also wanted to point out the difficulties with sugar uh, and the gross exploitation that um, colonialism brought with it. So we had, for example, these images of sugar, um, sugar cones uh, and so on. But we also wanted to point out the exploitation. So we borrowed in from St John's College some letters to do with the slave trade. Uh, this is an, an example of a letter from Jamaica and a sugar plantation. And they're talking about acquiring a gang of seasoned so-called Negroes to work on the sugar plantations. And we also showed this list of those um, Africans, the enslaved Africans who had to work in appalling conditions on these um, European managed and owned sugar plantations. Uh, and we had a, an illustration of the appalling conditions to make people think rather harder about that. And also then the idea of the fair trade um, uh, and not buying um, slave produced um, sugar. So how sugar was acquired, but also the problematics of it. Um, I'm now gonna hand over to Ivan to talk about um, some of the star objects um, in the exhibition. Ivan, over to you. Thank you, Vicky. Well, my role in the exhibition was to try and translate the wonderful paintings in the collection, a lot of the decorative art objects that belong to the table, also in the collection, um, and, and focus on what they told me as a food historian about food. So I'd like to start off by showing you this slide of a painting, which is by an artist called Van Miris. It dates from the 1730s. And it shows us um, a little open air stall or shop, um, which is selling food. If you look very carefully on the table, you'll be able to see some chestnuts. There are some meddlers. Um, it's a seasonal setting. We're actually in the late autumn, the onions hanging up, there's some partridges there. If you look in the background, you can see a tree that's bereft of leaves um, in front of a rather stormy looking sky. So we're at the tail end of the year and um, it's Netherlandish. And if you look very carefully on the wall behind the old lady who runs the shop, um, you can see um, in the detail um, some stockfish, some dried fish hanging up, which is throughout Europe a, a Christmas speciality. If you look very carefully, you see a little lollipop there, a little candied bird on the end of a stick. I think that's probably the earliest European um, depiction of a lollipop. And two gingerbreads, um, two little speculas. There's one at the top of um, a stag or possibly a reindeer. And then below, there's a little man, a little soldier, a militiaman with a pike. Um, and if we go on to the next slide, um, um, I recognize this uh, guy because I actually own a mold to make one. Um, this mold is probably English and it was probably carved when Shakespeare was still alive. So it's a lot older than the painting. But if you look very carefully, they're almost identical. They're in military uniform with a feathered cap and they're bearing this, this pike. Um, on the other side of the mold, on the next slide, you can see that the gingerbread pikeman is a companion, a missing item of history, the ginger woman. You know, equal opportunities to all gingerbread people, I say, because if you think of the modern gingerbread man, it was a little homunculus, you know, a Mr. Man with a row of currants for buttons. Um, these are two very sartorially elegant uh, characters, and we've actually done something with them here. We've, we've dressed them in gold. It was very common for gingerbread to be gilded. And it was often sold at fairs, um, often with something called Dutch gold leaf, which was a, a fake gold. But the context of gingerbread in, in England was um, quite different to the idea of giving them as gifts to children on the 5th of December, the, the Feast of St. Nicholas. So in, in the next slide, um, we're showing that um, in Britain during the 16th and 17th century, um, they often featured as novelties on tables at the very end or after a meal, what we called uh, the banquet course or the after course, which um, in the 16th and 17th century became an extraordinary array of sugar foods. For instance, um, this table has got uh, plates and tatsay stands made of sugar. You can actually see what looks like a little Chinese blue and white ware 
crack porcelain plate, which is actually made out of sugar. And standing in front of this sugar novelty building in the middle of the table, you can see our two little gingerbread people. And the recipes for making these occur in little books that were published mainly and aimed at, at gentle women who were literate and who wanted to make the kind of confectionery that was being made by professional comfort makers and of course at court. So if we go on to the next slide. So I wanted to interpret some of the paintings in the exhibition. Um, th this is a, a painting that is not in the Fitzwilliam collection. Um, Victoria managed to um, get it from Birmingham, from the art gallery there. Um, and it's a wonderful, very well-known painting of a Netherlandish kitchen scene, a very busy scene. There's a lot going on. But fundamentally, what we've got um, on the left, if we can go back to the full painting, um, on the left-hand side, you can see hanging by the, the chimney breast, um, a mechanical thing that turns spits. And you may notice I'm sitting in a kitchen. I've got one actually behind me. I don't know if you can see that up there. Um, that one we actually had hanging by the painting in the Fitzwilliam. So if we go back to the, the painting, so we're about to roast some meat. So if we focus on that detail again, if we go back to the detail, you can see that the, the cook is sewing some strips of back fat, of bacon fat, into a hare. A hare is a very, very dry animal. And when it rotates in front of a fire, um, you need to lubricate it with extra fat. So this was a very common practice. So if we go on to the next slide, Sorry, stay on that one actually for now. Go, go back to it, sorry. You can see also we, we depicted another um, way of showing this, a beautiful uh, mid 18th century mice and figure in the Fitzwilliam of a very well-dressed cook maid struggling with the bloody hair, which is just larded. Um, and if we go on to the next slide, you can see the actual kit that she's using. So, what we wanted to do was to expand all the things in that painting. So hanging next to the painting, we had the apparatus to roast the animal that was depicted in the picture, as well as the equipment that was used by the cook uh, to lard, lard the hair. Um, next slide. So I just round up here. Um, this is a table that I created, which got its original inspiration from a painting that wasn't in the exhibition, which is this one, which is a wonderful um, velvet Bruegel um, showing an incredible table covered with these incredible pies. If you look very carefully, you can see that the pastry decorations are gilded and there are spots of gold leaf on the bird's uh, plumage as well. Next. Um, this is the painting that is in the Fitzwilliam. I mean, you can take my word for it, you can't see it, but on that table of these um, celebrating uh, people from the Old Testament, um, there are some bird pies as well. Next one. And we decided that these kind of creations, these extraordinary pies with real taxidermy birds sitting on, were actually made. There are records of them being made in London. Um, and this is an incredible picture which shows a, a marvelous kind of unbelievable poultry's shop. And yes, all of those animals very sadly were consumed by people. So finally, um, one other inspiration was this wonderful um, painting by Joris van Son, um, which was specially cleaned for the exhibition with this incredible lobster. And then finally, if um, I show you um, how we exhibited this, um, I made those pies using equipment from the 17th century. So the little wooden molds that make all the wonderful kind of arabesques on the pastry um, were for real. Um, and in the background, we put this wonderful painting of the poulterer's shop. So you can see the provisioning and you can see the final result of one of the most extraordinary high status styles of table display in, in the history of dining. Um, Ivan, thank you so much. So I'm just going to wrap up quickly now with just a few comments about our public programmes. 
um, a creative zone that was um, put in at the end of the exhibition to really try to engage our audiences in multi-sensory ways um, with the exhibition. And then finally, Polly asked me to say something about um, public responses. So um, in terms of the um, public programmes, I should say that we have a very um, skilled and experienced learning team, and they all have specialisms in dealing with different types of audiences. And this is just um, a screen showing four different types of um, particular um, audience engagement. So you can see um, our work with um, those who have um, who live with dementia and their carers and how they were engaging with the exhibition and creating artistic responses. Uh, you can see we also have um, a special program for those with um, blind and um, uh, who are blind and partially sighted. And we consulted with them before the exhibition talking um, about some of the exhibits, they were able to handle them and we wanted to find out from them how they would like to um, bring in non-visual aids into the exhibition. This is partly why we created the Creative Zone. Um, we also do um, work with um, disadvantaged families in areas of deprivation in Cambridge. So the talking and eating together with a Cambridge City Council funded programme to um, engage um, families with, with speech and also um, how to um, you know, eating at the table and so on. And also we do um, work with particular schools. So um, this is just a, a very small example of the programmes that we did. I just wanted to say a little bit more in detail about one particular programme I was involved in from the start. We have long standing links with the wonderful Rowan Arts um, um, studio in Cambridge and they do work with learning disabled adults. Um, and we wanted to bring these um, wonderful art students into the equation from the beginning. So we um, developed a programme for them all the way through from the pre-planning stages. You'll see um, we brought them in on a number of occasions to discuss which exhibits should be in the show and how they should be displayed. And you'll see here that we're discussing that the pomegranate uh, 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 charger should be uh, displayed um, vertically. They then came back into the museum and they were filmed um, handling some of the exhibits that were going to go in the show together with some ceramic responses that they had made specifically for um, um, in response to these bids and I decided I wanted to display some of them into the exhibition. Um, the film um, also included them making food together um, at the Rowan Arts Centre and eating and talking about food experiences because this was a way to bring in the making of food and eating into the exhibition in the film. Um, as I say, I also felt it was important that their artistic responses should be included in the creative zone at the end. So you can see them with their exhibits looking um, delighted that they are there. The creative zone had the film, as you can see, and their ceramics. Um, it also had this multi-sensory mini pineapple that you could touch and with a hand pump you could squeeze it and smell pineapple. This is a way of getting some perfumes and food smells in there. There was this interactive box where some of the exhibits uh, became, as it were, first person. So the lobster from the table was a mini thing that you popped onto this box and it spoke to you in the first person and you could listen to him talking about himself, which was meant for the children, but the adults liked it very much. We also wanted visual responses. So we set up uh, a still life table and you can see some students and some families um, creating visual responses together. Uh, and you can see some of these wonderful visual responses that we kept because we think they're very important in terms, some people prefer to give you visual rather than verbal responses. And here are a few more, I think they're absolutely wonderful. Um, we also did a feedback wall. We did, did um, a, a feedback form. One of the questions we said to the visitors were, what three words most come to mind having visited the show? Uh, and we did a survey and then you can see which words came up most popular. We had you know, a, a terrific response actually. It's very, very interesting to see what the words that came up were. And then we asked for some feedback and I don't unfortunately have time to read all of these comments out, but I think you can see that actually people had a very, very profound um, response to the, um, uh, to the exhibition and they thought about changing their food habits, they thought about cooking more, they thought about 
where their food was coming from. Um, and so as I say, we're sadly now shut, but you can, uh, the exhibition lives on in the catalogue, which is still available to purchase and also on the website. And that is the link to the website. And I'll now hand over to Hélène. Thank you very much. I'm very delighted to be, to be here tonight and very honored to be invited uh, to this event and to be able to show you uh, our exhibition, which is not opened yet, but we will open it uh, next Wednesday. Um, so uh, maybe we can start with the, the presentation. Um, this, uh, this exhibition is also a, uh, a collective work. The idea of it uh, was uh, from uh, Zev Gourarie, which uh, who was the, the, the chief curator of this exhibition, and uh, the director of the Louvre Lens, uh, Marie Lavandier, who wanted to show, um, uh, because for many years the Louvre Lens has been uh, has delivered um, to ex public uh, the thematical uh, exhibitions to deal with universal subjects, uh, such as, for example, Love, uh, which was an exhibition also by Zev Gourarie. And uh, this one shows how banquets and feasts were occasions for princes and head of states um, to show their power and either to stage the hierarchy of, uh, of the society or to promote the equality of the citizenship. Uh, so the visitor will enter um, the, with a prologue. And this prologue is a kind of joke about COVID uh, because it deals with a, le, the, the, and of course it is based also on, uh, on uh, so sociological and historical facts. It deals with the fact that the hand washing is the first step to a meal. And of course the hand washing is now a, a hygienic act, but uh, at the time it was, it was a purification before this very sanctified moment of the meal, because of course, um, the powerful would, uh, would eat, but the less powerful maybe would fast. So um, after this prologue, you will enter the first part. Um, and the first part deals uh, with uh, the creation of the states and the creation of the, of the cities in Mesopotamia and how these states and cities uh, would have banquets uh, which were part of the worship of gods because uh, it was held, they, the banquets uh, were held to honor the, the deities. Um, so you will see, for example, the very, very ancient uh, images of these banquets, we were, which were liturgical banquets. Um, and this one, for example, was loaned by the, the Louvre Museum and is characteristic from uh, the, the, Sumerian, uh, the Sumerian era. So we are uh, in the, the third millennium BC. So you will spend uh, the, uh, the exhibition going from uh, 3000 BC to uh, up till now. In the next room, you will see how in the, in the second and the first millennium, the archives of, uh, of these uh, eras show us how uh, this downing art of protocol um, is used uh, then by the kings of Egypt, Mesopotamia, Anatolia, and uh, the Levant uh, to invite each other uh, and to and to invite ambassadors and to show, to showcase the, the luxury vessel uh, and also the richness and the rarity of, uh, of the dishes. During the first millennium, there is a, a new fashion beginning adopted then by the Greeks and the Etruscans and the Romans, uh, the, uh, the new fashion of reclining while having a meal. 
Um, so the, the Greeks adopted the, the reclining pos uh, position um, and at the same time invented a new conception of uh, um, sharing a meal and a new conception of table manners um, with the, the emergence of citizenship and the new notion of conviviality uh, which takes place in the Enron. So there, uh, the, the key point of, uh, of these banquets and the, the, part, the, the, the most important part was the second part of the banquet, not when, when you would have a meal, but when you would drink. At, at the end of uh, the banquet, during the symposium, you would have also jokes and uh, a manner of, uh, of uh, joking between men, because of course these, uh, these uh, banquets were banquets for, ma for male people. At the end of, uh, of antiquity, um, the, uh, the, um, the important thing is to, to show your luxury vases. So there is an invention of a, a beautiful object um, uh, which, is, uh, we, which showcase these, uh, these, um, uh, these uh, beautiful vases. And during the, the third part of the exhibition, you will have uh, sideboards, you will have um, luxury vessels, uh, of course, uh, from, uh, from France, but also from England and from, uh, from Austria, uh, which will lead you to uh, the ritual of uh, the sovereign's meal uh, which increase, increases uh, through times and the climax of it is during the, the, the reign of uh, Louis the, the 14th in France with the Grand Couvert. The Grand Couvert which becomes so excessive as a protocol that it will lead to uh, a new approach of, uh, of um, uh, meal sharing in the in the um, um, the, um, uh, the 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 age of uh, of uh, lights in uh, in France, uh, with the creation uh, during the reign of uh, Louis the the fifteenth uh, of a new room in uh, in Versailles, which is a dining room, a dining room where uh, where the king would uh, invite his close relations to a refined supper and have a, a small supper with, between friends. And also the 18th century is uh, uh, the century of Chinese porcelain, which will be imitated throughout Europe. So the, 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 the 18th century is the time where King will dine in an earthenware uh, and not uh, in, uh, in uh, metalware in Europe. So you will have these uh, fastuous uh, um, services in, uh, in Sèvres and Saxe porcelain, uh, which will be given by kings and emperors to, uh, to other kings and emperors as uh, political and diplomatic gifts. And then we will finish with a, uh, the contemporary part of uh, the exhibition. Uh, where the, the French Republic will invent uh, another kind of protocol, mixing the royal protocol uh, and uh, the, uh, another protocol of conviviality where every guest is an equal, uh, as it was in, the, in Greece. Uh, so the organization of the state dinner at uh, the Elysee Palace uh, will conform to a very strict protocol. Um, and of course, you will have the, uh, the menus. The menus are showcases for, uh, for the, the French gastronomy and uh, the terroirs of France. 
uh, but you will also show the exhibition will also show you that uh, there is an evolution in the in these uh, menus because uh, throughout uh, the the 20th century uh, you will see the number of dishes um, uh, uh, that the number of dishes uh, uh, will reduce very uh, very drastically and um, of course, the Elysee Palace uh, gives the same welcome to every guest, but also the, the special guests will always be the, the Queen of England in the, in the Elysee Palace. So we'll hope that uh, we will we'll be able to welcome many, many visitors from the UK as well. Hello, thank you so much. I cannot believe that you were just forced all of you to talk about these extraordinary exhibitions which deal with such kind of breadth and depth into the subjects and you have to squash them into uh, 15 minutes each. You've did an amazing job. So thank you very much for giving us a kind of taste and a flavor. We've got masses of questions coming in, which is wonderful. But before we get to those, I just wanted to ask a, a couple of questions to kind of draw out some of the sort of ideas behind the exhibition. And I just wanted to start with you, perhaps, um, Vicky, about the time frame. You, Vicky and, and Helen, about the kind of time frame uh, of each of them Feast and Fast, 1500 to 1800, and then Tables of Power, 5,000 years. Why those, why those frames? What were you trying to do? Why were they significant? If you can try and, again, I'm sorry, I'm going to compress you into time. I'm being a merciless timekeeper. But yes, could, uh, could you think about that for us, Vicky? Sure, I mean, it's a very interesting question and I really do um, admire Hélène's um, global ambition and this chronological sweep. Um, we decided to um, keep the exhibition fairly focused, um, thinking that actually the time period we chose was um, quite long enough. There are various sort of pragmatic reasons. Uh, Dr. Melissa Calareso, say the co-curator, um, she is particularly expert in the sort of the 18th century and my field of specialism is really the Renaissance. So we were kind of playing to our strengths. It should also be said that in terms of the sorts of material that we showed in the exhibition, the Fitzwilliam Museum has particular strengths in that, in, in that time frame, in the Renaissance through to the sort of, um, uh, you know, sort of um, early modern uh, early modern period. Um, uh, so we, I think also that um, a lot changes really um, in the sort of the Victorian period in in the nineteenth century. So we felt it was better to uh, limit it to that that particular time period, but also make sure that then we drew parallels with the present day to make it very relevant, but it was contained because of our expertise and the objects that the museum has. Thank you. That's really, that's, that's fascinating. That kind of mix of pragmatic, the sort of pragmatic and also the kind of themes and ideas <laughs> coming together. Elaine, could you answer the same question, please? Yeah, uh, for us, it is very important because we are the Louvre Lens, so it is the Louvre in north of France. Uh, to, to be the what we call the Louvre with a difference, so it, we 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 do very universal uh, thematical uh, exhibitions, but with this um, uh, this idea of um, dealing with with them for a very very long period of time. So, because we are lucky to have this very close relationship to the Louvre. The Louvre in Paris, uh, we are able to, to ask for loans uh, in all the departments. So we, we are able to, to put together Mesopotamia, uh, the, the France in the Renaissance, and, uh, and also every, every kind of period. That, that is kind of overwhelming in a way. And I suppose one of the things is that you have a huge luxury of not just objects, but also space at the Louvre Lons that allows you to tell this huge story, which is so exciting. Um, I wanted to ask you, Ellen, and also Ivan, about the extent to which the exhibitions deal with food beliefs, food habits, food cultures, which are very sort of familiar to us that are about, it's about continuity or the degree to which 
your respective exhibitions are actually showing us worlds which just seem completely alien in terms of understandings and experiences of food. Ivan, would you like to think about that for? Sure, I, I think looking at those strange pies with swans and peacocks sitting on top of them, um, you realize that food was served in a very different universe back in the 16th and 17th century. Um, thank God that, that one has gone because in that wonderful painting of the poultry shop um, by Schneiders, there were actually two little kingfishers which were for sale. And I know of a feast in London in 1607 when James I was actually served a pie with an owl baked inside it, but another one sitting on top. So, you know, we've lost a lot of stuff, which I think probably did deserve to become extinct. Um, familiar things, I mean, this is an extraordinary thing. Of course, all the food we eat now was created by our ancestors. We didn't invent cheese, butter, beer, any bread. It was all worked out by people, often by Neolithic farmers. All of our staple foods, whether it's rice, oats, wheat, you know, cassava, sorghum, whatever, all of those plants were actually bred by Neolithic farmers, and we've inherited that. But there are other sort of, if I call them really like vapor trails to the past, which for instance, you know, you go into a restaurant, most restaurants in France and England will have a table napkin on the left-hand side of your table setting. And there's a reason for that, because originally before the knife, sorry, before the fork became around, people had to wipe the left hand where they touch their meat to cut it on a napkin over their shoulder. It wasn't like a big square thing, it was like a towel and you cleaned it and you threw it over your left shoulder. When the fork arrived, that piece of cloth moved onto your lap to stop food going on there. And of course we've forgotten all this, but still there's this kind of folk, not a memory, but a relic of the left hand side being the place where the napkin lives. Um, and food is full of these extraordinary relic things, which most people, you know, just don't understand them at all. And we try to illuminate that in, in some of the parts of the exhibition. Thank you, Ivan. Ellen? Um, yes, it is, it is very interesting that to, to see throughout a very long period of time that there is continuity and also there are exotic things uh, so continuity, for example, was for me to, to discover that uh, the moment, uh, which is the, 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 quite the, 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 the most important moment, is always the moment when you drink during a meal um, or du during which there is, a, there is music and, uh, and um, advertisement. And uh, um, this is... Uh, this is true for Mesopotamia, because when people drink, you will have music and, uh, and uh, uh, clowns and uh, jonglers. And this is also true in Elysee, because after the meal, you will have uh, a, a show of, uh, of music or, uh, or a play uh, after you, you, you will have dinner. Those are just really, I've got lots of questions to ask from those, but I've also got so many questions coming in from the audience that I actually feel that we ought to sort of ask, that, let them have some questions because there are some terrific questions here. So I'm going to, to start working through these. Um, there's a first one here that I think it would be great if all of you could answer this, uh, starting with Vicky. The, this is from um, Jan Marshall. Uh, the Prince Regent was renowned for his extravagant and ostentatious banquets. What would you regard as the most extravagant banquet in history from any period of time? Um, own... Gosh, well, I think there were, very, there were enormous numbers of extravagant banquets. And I think Ivan is probably better placed to answer that than me. I mean, there are ma many records um, for example, in this sort of, you know, the Royal Archives, documenting absolutely excessive banquets. But I think it's also interesting to remember that uh, what the royals would eat on a daily basis, we would consider completely extravagant. And there'd be multiple dishes of which they would just sort of pick one or two little dainty pieces. And then actually once they had gone, actually, you know, the sort of the courses would have a pick and then down to the servants. So, um, 
yeah, I mean, extravagant banquets, um, there, there are many. And I think in a sense, um, the banquet that I've been recreated, the Baroque feasting table, we were trying to sort of um, show generic, very, very extravagant banquet that you could have found across Europe um, at the beginning of the 17th century with the four bird pies, you know, swan, pheasant, peacock and partridge. And those, the four birds, the pies, were specifically taken from the key birds that were hung in that Snyder's painting. But I think Ivan um, might want to say more about that. Well, yeah, it's a, it's a very easy one to answer because um, it's um, the bicentenary, actually, of the coronation feast of that gentleman, the Prince Regent, who was mentioned in the question, who became George IV in July 1821, which is 200 years ago. Um, and that meal was one of the most extravagant, not just for the food, but also for the glorious tableware, extraordinary silver gilt tableware made by some of the great goldsmiths of Regency London. Um, and the food was also amazing. The, the king uh, sat um, in Westminster Hall at a table with six of his brothers, um, and they had um, two main courses. The first course had um, 20 dishes in with four different soups, including turtle, mulligatawny, and a couple of others, lots of roast meats, all invisible in a sense um, in the hall, because it was all served in these extraordinary silver gilt tureens um, from the grand service. And then the second course, had 22 different dishes in, um, although four of them were decorative. They, there was a, a sugar model of a ruined temple, another one of a rotunda and other sort of elements, um, and, and lots of sort of lighter savory foods. Um, and this is all choreographed because the food was delivered to the table um, by a procession of men with horses coming down the central aisle of Westminster Hall. And then finally, the dessert, um, I think had 24 different dishes in it, you know. Um, and we know that um, the king, the newly crowned king, just toyed with some turtle soup, which we know is his favorite dish. And I think he, there was a, I think a partridge pie that he had a little slice of. And, um, and that was it, basically. Um, and he left early. And the th idea was that you, you couldn't tell a king what he you know, had to eat. You just put in a huge array, like going into a restaurant and having every item on the menu put in front of you so that no one could dictate to you what you ate. So that is the bicentenary of a remarkable event. And it was incredibly illustrated. There are wonderful paintings and chromolithographs. And the menu survives, and you can look at it online if you... Um, go on to the Georgian papers on the on the um, the uh, Royal Collection website. That is fantastic, Ellen. Could could you answer that question? Yeah, I have in mind, of course, because that's my specialty: the uh, the, the the big big feast uh, held by uh, Ashur Nadirpal uh, II uh, for um, thirteen thousand people. Uh, in Ellen, a, yeah, Ellen, please forgive me, but can you just say when that was so that? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, it was in the eighteenth, uh, not the eighteenth, the yeah, the eighteenth century BC. Thank you. In Mesopotamia, uh, but I have in mind just one text. It, it is a, a very little piece of uh, of uh, of glaze. Uh, in uh, in our exhibition, and it was uh, it is a text very rare because it's a text about the deliciousness of of, uh, of a of a meal or of a dish, a specific dish, and it is a rarity because uh, in the antiquity you would speak about the amount of food, but not not the taste of food. So this, this is to my colleagues, the, the Assyriologues colleagues, uh, this is a very rare text. And this is a text about a letter sent to uh, an intendant of a palace saying that uh, the, uh, the intendant of uh, the palace of, uh, of the king of Babylonia should taste this food because it's delicious and it is rat. Desert rats. 
<laughs> how extraordinary and you know how wonderful though to be thinking about taste and deliciousness not just what something looks like in terms of you know it's kind of visual appeal um what a shame it was a rat and th this and Ivan, delicious and delicious yeah don't be close-minded uh, Ivan your um description of that pit of Prince Regent's feast uh it, it sort of leads me to another question because it's sort of slightly reminiscent of the kind of all all you can eat buffet you might get at a pizza hut for you know where you just can go and sort of hoover up as much as you want or a holiday camp uh, so there's a really nice question uh, here can the panel trace a line from the early modern periods type of display to, to, to today's food display whether in shops or home kitchens or instagram and if not, when did approaches to food display make a break with older approaches to food display? Perhaps you, Ivan, and, and then, or yeah, Ivan, would you like to? Sure, yeah. I mean, this is really about um, an uncharted area, really, which is about the aesthetics of food on the table or on the plate. And it changes so rapidly. I mean, about 10 years ago, um, food was became an abstract expressionist composition on the plate. You know, you had a little splash of that, a little smear of that, a little tower of this, you know. If you went back 200 years ago into the 18th century, um, you know, at the beginning of the 18th century, a pie, for instance, might be made in a Rococo style, you know, with um, extraordinary kind of, you know, applied ornament. Um, by the end of the 18th century, um, it might be neoclassical. And, the, you know, the, the, the zeitgeist, really, of aesthetics was applying just as much to food as it was, you know, to decorating your palace or, you know, the kind of pictures that you preferred. And, of course, um, we've been talking, Vicky and I particularly, well, Hélène, too, about excess, really, a visual excess as well as culinary excess. And... Um, if you think about food in the early part of the 20th century, um, it was, you know, cucina povera. It was basically modernity made everything very, very simple. Um, and the very, very fancy Victorian over-embellished, overdone food with lots of different courses got whittled down for obvious historic reasons. You know, the First World War, we became an industrialized society. So all these the sort of dynamics they feed into how our food appears. Now, of course, you know, we are sort of basically um, crushed under a tsunami of beautifully illustrated cookery books. Um, and the authors are often leading these aesthetic changes. And of course, the internet too, particularly with Instagram, which is a, a very, very fashionable medium for cooks and confectioners and bakers, to exchange idea and it's become very competitive you know people put out there a much more intricate you know kind of decorated top than the last person um, so things are changing enormously but it's there's always been competition amongst food professionals you know to produce the finest dish so I mean, it's a complicated area and it needs a book somebody ought to write a book about changing aesthetics in food Ivan, I think you need to write that book, or perhaps <laughs> the three of you should write that book, all of you together. Um, how about this? Uh, in the past year with the pandemic, how do you think our sharing of food and eating has changed? But I think this is the question that's really interesting in a way is, have these changes been seen before in history with responses to other diseases, famines, crises around food? Um, Victoria, would you like to... Reflect I think on Ivan, Ivan would be much better placed to answer the historical questions. I can do museology and exhibition things, but I think I'm going to pass that to Ivan, if I may. OK, well, why don't we start with Ellen? Do you have anything, just in case, Ellen, do you have something to say about that in terms of antiquity, perhaps, and famine and, or disease and food? Um, maybe not with antiquity, but I, it, it makes me think about the, uh, the, the fear of poison during the medieval ages, and the uh, the use to uh, the use of objects, uh, magical objects, and uh, the use of um, of the nef de table, for example, because in the medieval ages and even in the in the Renaissance time, uh, there, there was this fear of being poisoned 
that would uh, lead a, a, a king to, to have this vessel uh, where he could put his knife in and his uh, salt, pepper, uh, things like that uh, in a very uh, closed thing, like the nef de table. So yeah, for, for me, there, there, there are things like that. So there's kind of anxiety around yeah. the, and the kind of risk of, of poisoning. Yeah, that's really interesting. The kind of keeping food safe and sterile and uh, preventing disease and contamination. But And Ivan? Well, uh, food and medicine have always been incredibly linked together. Um, and if you look back at other pandemics and pestilences, for instance, you know, during the, the Black Death and in, in the 17th century, the plague, um, often in cookery books, you often have a section, the printed cookery books and handwritten ones, which is based on medicine. And you, you do get remedies for treating the plague. Some of them um, are not just medicines, they sometimes move into the sort of food area. For instance, the Fitzwilliam, where our exhibition is displayed, has got a remarkably rich collection of English Delftware uh, in what's called the Glacier Collection. And there are lots of posset pots, which are these extraordinary, usually blue and white, um, it's terracotta that's got a tin glaze on it with little blue kind of designs on it. And a posset was a very sort of warming supper dish usually. It was made from cream, egg yolks, and usually some strong wine, usually sack and sugar, maybe some spice as well. And often to sort of help the posset sort of, you know, go down. And if you were ill, they would sometimes put medicines in them as well. I mean, I think Shakespeare said something about somebody drugging the possets. And there are quite a few recipes for posset um, which came out during the time of the, the, the plague, in fact. So um, a lot of those vessels in this vast collection that we didn't actually display because we thought they were more to do with beverages and we didn't discuss drink in our exhibition. Maybe we'll do another one about ah, drink one day, you know. Um, that, but, you know, there is this extraordinary crossover and you do find it in the, you'll know as a curator of ancient cookery texts, Polly, that, you know, this, this, this one side of this page is, or the coin is medicine, the other is food. So um, they are, they're completely interchangeable. Yeah. And that, that leads me on. I think we've got time just for one more quick question for uh, Vicky and for Elaine. And you sort of just alluded to, to it, um, Ivan, which is what did you have to leave out? Someone's asked, what, what did you leave out that you really wanted to include? I mean, these are huge exhibitions covering a huge amount, but of course you have to make choices. Could you just tell us one or two choices that you had to make that were difficult? Uh, Vicky. Sure, I mean, it's a very interesting question. Um, we um, unfortunately don't have as much space as Hélène does in the Louvre Long. And um, so the question really for us was visual impact and actually trying to make uh, interesting visual narratives. So sometimes we would decide to include quite a lot of exhibits and mass them together. And sometimes we felt it was better just to choose one example of something and then um, showcase that. So for example, we didn't include an awful lot of cutlery. Um, we had thought at one uh, point about doing a, a case of the universal spoon and including actually talking a, a global story and a very much, much longer chronological story. And in the end, because of lack of space, the, the spoon story sadly didn't make it in. Um, and we included um, a number of um, knives, for example, a pair of rare bride knives that Ivan had found for us on the um, um, Tudor wedding bank sugar banquet table, and we included um, a pair of um, carving, a carving knife and fork in the context of the uh, Baroque feasting table. Um, but we have a really superb collection of cutlery uh, made from in different European centres across time. You know, we could have talked more about the introduction of the fork, but sadly, um, we decided that actually there were other narratives we wanted to say, so tell. So um, I would have liked to have included, for example, yes, more of our cutlery, but that simply wasn't possible. 
I, I think there are there are calls in uh, the questions here for there to be another or a different exhibition on a similar subject. So I think that the, the forks and cutlery can go in that next exhibition, Vicky. Ellen, could you quickly, we're really out of time, but could you just quickly say what had to be left out? Yeah, of course, the, the expensive loans very far away were out of questions. And um, the, the, the first thing I had to renounce was uh, the, the Uruk vase which is in the Iraq Museum at Baghdad, and which displays the first ever banquet scene. It is uh, 3000 in, uh, BC, and we couldn't have it. That was... Uh, well, that, that must have been very, yeah, sort of heartbreaking in a sense. You obviously have so much in there, but again, tantalizing to hear about it and also, you know, I think that this talk and hearing about these exhibitions and reading the questions and the responses just is telling us all that people love this subject and there is so much more to learn and explore. You know, you're going to be writing your book on aesthetics now. We need more exhibitions like this. Everyone needs to go to the Louvre Lens uh, if they can get out there, if Mr. Rob will let us travel um, from the UK. Uh, I want to thank the panel. This could have gone on for hours. We have just touched the surface, but what wonderful details and texture and kind of, I can always sort of taste it. It's just so wonderful. Thank you so much. I want to say a couple of things just to remember that Feast and Fast is no longer open. Please do go to the Fitzwilliam Museum because it's wonderful when it opens, but don't go to see that. But I understand that our book tab is not working today. So I'm just holding up the catalogue again because it is available still in uh, some reputable booksellers. It is the most wonderful, sumptuous wonderful catalogue I don't know is there a catalogue for the tables of power there is so again uh, everybody should look that out as well because if you can't get to an exhibition that is the next best thing thank you to my amazing panel it's been a complete pleasure thank you to the audience as well please check out um, the future food season events coming up next week and then the week after that um, please send us any comments or feedback about this event remember that there's a donate button if you feel so inclined to support our work um, you will be able to watch this event on catch up if for any reason it was glitchy or if you would like to share it with friends and family um, in a couple of days it should be available and finally once again thank you to this amazing panel of speakers and thank you for the work you do in exhibitions and museums good night <laughs>